Well, as you can tell from that track, which is off the CD called Intoxicate from Michael Wolf and Impure Thoughts, we are going to be talking now to one of the top musicians on this planet. He is a p- pianist, composer. He's led bands with Nancy Wilson and the Arsenio Hall Show Band. He's played with Sonny Rollins, Cannonball, Adderley, and this CD, Intoxicate, we've been playing for quite a while here on the program. He's got four dates in New York City this week at the West Bank Cafe, and we'll be talking all about that. But without further ado, I'm going to welcome to the Upper Room with Joe Kelly on WVOF, Mr. Michael Wolf. How you doing, Michael? Michael? How you doing? Good, I'm fine. And uh, we got you all set. Good. And uh, we... Hey, Nat, close the door, would you, Nat? Kids. <laughs> okay, yeah, good. So, uh, hey, you know, we have new studios here. So, uh, you know, this summer, love to have you. Yeah, we'd love to come up and try to do something. Yeah, here, yeah. So, so it's real nice. And, and you're getting together uh, this week for four dates uh, in New York City with, with uh, some fellows you, you've been loving to play with right on this record as well, right? Yeah, it's great. We have our, the band that I've been playing with for the last two and a half, three years is uh, the Impure Thoughts Band with uh, Alex Faust. Foster on saxophones, and Frank Colon on percussion, Badal Roy on tablas, John B. Williams on bass, and Victor Jones on drums. And that's the regular band that we've been traveling around with and that I've recorded with the last two CDs. So when you decided to record Intoxicate, how, how long were the songs in the making, or you've been working with this band a while with it? Well, yeah, well, some of the tunes we've been playing live, and the, some sketches I just brought into the studio, most of them we had been playing, and then I had a, some rehearsing beforehand, but... I had five days in the studio, and I really wanted to approach it more like a live performance, even though it was in the studio. So that we just, like there's a tune cool on there. I had written a whole melody. We never even got to the melody. We just were grooving so hard. We kept on the groove. So, you know, I just wanted it to progress as it progressed on our live uh, gigs because we don't plan anything out on the gigs. I mean, we have the basic structure of the tune, but we can go wherever it wants. And I never have a set list planned, and we just go from one instrument to the other. So... That was the approach I wanted in the studio, as close as possible. When you record with, you know, for jazz musicians, I mean, you're you're a musician, period. But you know, on that kind of schedule, jazz musician per se, is it is it a lot of pressure to get things done during that time? Or? Yeah, it's a lot of pressure. But this band's been together long enough now that the, you know, the first CD I felt more pressure on. Just we did different sessions, and you know, I just didn't know as much how to deal with this band. But now that we've been together a while and even though there are three drummers, you know, tabla player, Afro-Cuban, Brazilian percussionist, and then the drum set. But we played enough together now that we all just sort of fall into our roles naturally. So it's much easier now. So there, I do feel pressure in my own playing, really, to make sure I play as well as I can. And, you know, it's, you only, it's on there forever. Right. So I really want to be, you know, I want to really say what I want to say as succinctly and, and as freely as possible, even though that seems like they're, you know, in uh, conflict and not really, you know. So some of the studios you work with, uh, I know you you split time between the two coasts, right? Right. I mean, I really like the studios in Los Angeles better only because they're, you know, space is not an issue there. In New York, everything is so crowded, and, you know, to have a big space, it's a much more expensive studio, but I have an amazing place, Private Island Tracks, that I record out in uh, in L.A., and I just get, you get, you can have a much more luxurious time recording and not worry so much about the price. But then... And the, the place back pocket that I used here in New York where I recorded uh, a couple of the tunes and, and I did uh, the sexual healing stuff with Charlie Hunter. Uh, you know, that was a great studio, too. But I just I, I was in L.A. able to have a great Bosendorfer piano and just much more of a relaxed environment. And also, the band, except for John B. Williams, all lives in New York. So when we go out to L.A., we're much more concentrated just on being together and doing the album. So it's a little bit like the old-fashioned times when a band went out to the country and just lived in a house and made a record. It's more right. of that feeling. Do you base yourself out in New York or you split time? Yeah, I base myself out in New York, though I do have a house in L.A., but we, I have two young kids, four and seven, and they're in school here right in New York City. We live down in the village, and uh, you know, my wife's an actress and a writer, and so it just feels like that's the most creative place for us to be is right in the heart of New York City. But we love being out in L.A., too. I do film scores, and that's more... You know, the business of film scoring and films is more out in L.A. And, and also it's more peaceful for me out there because I have a little little area of land and, you know, it's just a different kind of environment. So I like both, actually. Well, this week Michael Wolf will be appearing with his band 
Impure Thoughts at the West Bank Cafe. And uh, can you give the, the address for that one? Yeah, I can because I happen to have it on a piece of paper right okay. there. Uh huh. And it's <laughs> it's on 42nd Street and 9th Avenue. It's 407 West 42nd Street in Manhattan, corner of 42nd Street and 9th Avenue. And uh, I'm gonna. And there's a phone. Actually, a phone number you can call if you want reservations. So you can just show up. The phone number is two one two six nine five six nine zero nine six nine five six nine zero nine. It's only ten bucks. And we're going to do a concert thing, and this one is Michael Wolf in concert featuring him for your thoughts. So we're going to do one show a night. Wednesday and Thursday will be at 8 p.m., and Friday and Saturday will be at 9 p.m. But it's going to be a long show with an intermission, so it's really going to be like a concert. I'm going to start out solo piano and then add in some duo, a duo with Badal on tablas, and then a, a thing with Alex Foster on saxophone and piano. Yeah, and then we'll do some, some trio stuff I've been doing with bass and drums and piano, and we'll take a little break, and then we'll come on. Uh, with the full onslaught of impure thoughts, burning world kind of uh, funk jazz stuff, and we'll do an hour of that. Wow, that's so, yeah, well, I'm yeah. excited about it. It's like a little miniature Carnegie Hall concert. That's how I'm looking at it. You know, wow. getting ready for a Carnegie Hall type thing. Because <laughs> last year we played yeah. the Kennedy Center we went at the Terrace Theater. There it seats about a thousand people, and you know we were able to do this sort of concert. So it got me thinking. Instead of thinking of just one set and then another set, to try to think of a whole evening. So that's what we're putting together. And some of the uh, folks can expect some, some great, diverse <laughs> music. And, uh, and this uh, album definitely <laughs> exemplifies uh, what, what you've been listening to. You just don't focus on one genre. How about uh, what were you listening to and you know, prior to recording this? And what are you digging today down in Greenwich Village? You know, it's interesting. I'm, uh, well, you know, I'm really spending a lot of time composition and orchestration, so I'm listening a lot to, frankly, to Beethoven and Schubert and Messian and Ravel and Stravinsky and, you know, people like that. Um, and then when it comes to jazz, you know, I always listen to Miles Davis, you know, and they've done a lot of reissue stuff of Bitches Brew and In a Silent Wave sessions and, and the, the sketches of Spain stuff he did with Gil Evans. So I always listen to that music. To me, that's just like nutrition, you know. It's looked like the hippest, most delicious meal you could have is listening to that music. And then I listen to Radiohead. I love Radiohead. I, I listen to my Ray Charles stuff. You know, I just have tons of different things I listen to. My kids are into different kinds of music, so I listen to what they're into, you know, whether it's in sync or, or more hip-hop stuff. You know, I, I've always been eclectic in my taste with what I like to listen to. And you can't go wrong with the record stores in Greenwich Village. I used to live there mm -hmm. when I was going to NYU. That was, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's fantastic the yeah. Village Records and all that. You can go in and get, you know, vinyl and... And CDs, yeah. And a lot of times I get stuff, I don't even know what it is. I just hear it in the store and get some stuff and listen to it. So why don't we get into uh, a track right now off of uh, Intoxicate Michael Wolf and Impure Thoughts. You can go to michaelwolf.com. With uh, two Fs. With two Fs, that's right. And uh, all the information on the uh, upcoming tour dates. Uh, he'll be in New York April 10th through April 13th, the West Bank Cafe. And also there's uh, biography and all, all sorts of great information. And there'll be some dates coming up on the West Coast and also uh, overseas. So Michael Wolf is a very busy musician, and he's my special guest here. And uh, let's see. How about Cool? Yeah, that would be you great. Men you mentioned that. Uh, it's That's kind a of a different uh, Yeah, we started. Track. You know, this is the first time I think you've ever had Bering Bow, which is a Brazilian instrument that looks like a bow and arrow, and a guy hits it with a stick. It's a long wire that really did, with a little with that little big bow and arrow looking thing and then a little round gourd at the end. It, gets, it sounds like down, 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 and tablas and bass and piano. That's basically what it is. And, um, you know, I wrote a whole tune with a melody, and, and we just, when we got into the groove, and in fact, we were rehearsing, and I said, turn on the, you know, we use Pro Tools, turn on the machine. <clears throat> so it started it right in, in the middle of our groove, and we just kept going, and then I improvised a few little, counter melody things and we never got to the real melody and we just played it, it just it was a magical one take kind of experience in the studio and so uh, that was captured that's one of the great things about being in the studio when you're set up to just record everything so uh, that's what cool is okay we're going to get into it right now this is from michael wolf and impure thoughts from intoxicate and it's cool and that's cool from michael wolf and impure thoughts intoxicate is the cd you can go to michaelwolf.com and that's two f's and uh, find out all the information about ordering this great release. And uh, we are going to welcome back to WVOF and uh, 88.5, Mr. Michael Wolf. So uh, 
you know, th- this is a, a great, uh, diverse album. You finding a lot of people uh, enjoying it as far as yeah, like, young a, and old? And to make her, uh, you know, it, to do anything. First of all, to play live is the main thing that we're about, and so you play and to have people respond. But then with a CD, it's a little more distant, so it's nice when people come up and go, man, I really like the CD, and it's done really well. And Satellite X Radio, it's been number one and, you know, top five for a long time, and it's, you know, it's nice when people are responding to it, so I'm very happy about that, and it's selling pretty well, so can't complain. You know? Yeah, that, that, that's great, yeah. and I'm glad to see uh, radio um, clicking into it. That, that's yeah, really... they've been great, you know, it's not a straight-ahead record, but jazz radio's been behind it, and other kinds of radio, and, you know, uh, which is what I like, alternative stuff, college, it's really nice to get that response, really happy about it. Now, if if you don't mind, if we talk a little bit about your background as a musician, uh, sure. Do you remember the moment that uh, you said to yourself that this is going to be your career and, and your passion? Well, I'll tell you one time. One thing that when I was about twelve years old, my father and I were going. I was living. I had grown up in the South originally, but I was living in the San Francisco Bay Area, and we were going to a wedding. He and I to in Mississippi, and he we stopped off in Las Vegas, and he'd arranged for us to see the. Sammy Davis Jr.'s Midnight Show. And when this time, in those days, Sammy Davis would, you know, sing, but he'd play the drums, he'd play the piano, he played the trumpet, he did all this stuff, and I thought, man, I'd love to do that. And that was the first time I realized that maybe you could do that, some kind of entertaining music, kind of jazzy kind of thing for a living. And then, as uh, you know, I had been taking piano lessons all along, and really when I got into high school, about 15, 16 that's when I realized that I, I just didn't even consider doing anything else. I just wanted to be a jazz musician. It just seemed like a great thing, and I liked the fact that it was a subculture. It wasn't just a regular society, you know, and, and, then, and it was in Berkeley, California, which was very supportive of being a musician, so I was really lucky, and my, my father was an amateur musician, and he supported me, so I was very lucky to have all that background sort of, sort of preset so that when I wanted to do it, uh, I would say that I was you know, ready to do it. But I think just seeing other people is what really turned me on. I remember once I went and saw Ray Charles, I even seeing James Taylor, you know, just different, seeing musicians and seeing them up there, that just looked to me like the most exciting thing you could possibly do. And it still feels like that. And do you get out a lot to see uh, live shows? You know, I don't go out as much as I used to. I had two kids, but I do like to go out and hear live music much more than listen to CDs. I'm just, live music is what does it for me. So I'll go you know, to clubs here. I'll go to the, you know, the Village Vanguard. And whatever clubs have somebody playing that I want to hear, I'll go to concerts. Uh, I'll go out to see musicals and little opera, you know, whatever. Yeah, I do like to go out and hear it. And, uh, you know, we mentioned, of course, a lot of people know uh, your background as being the uh, the uh, band leader for the Arsenio Hall Show. And um, how, how did you first uh, get involved with Arsenio, and how, how did that come about of, of, of running the band there for quite a number of well, years? Well, I... I was the musical director and band leader for jazz singer Nancy Wilson for about five and a half years, and we were playing a gig. Uh, uh, hold on a sec. We're, uh, so we were playing a gig. We were playing a gig at uh, in Chicago, and Arsenio was our opening act. So what happened was uh, we became friends and toured together. And, and uh, at the end of that, he said, well, you know, one day I'm going to have a talk show, and you're going to do the, the music. And I said, sure, that sounds great, man. So... You know, that's when we got hooked up, and then years later he got the gig and called me up. I was living in New York, and actually wrote me a letter and said, do you want to do this? And I said, okay, I'll do it. So it worked out really well. Now, you, your band was smoking every night, and, uh, of course, you, your uh, bass player, good friend John B. Williams, is still, still mm-hmm. Yeah, we're still playing together. With it. Yeah. Right. The, those, uh, the days out there and having musical guests out there were off the top of your head. Uh, who blew you away and you were, like, looking forward to all all week long or months knowing this person was going to be in the studio with you? Well, the people that were the most fun to me were the people that I had grown up with as my jazz idols. So when Herbie Hancock, he came on about five times to get to play with him. You know, he'd play piano and I'd play Rhodes or we'd switch or whatever. That was exciting. Chick Corea, Wayne Shorter, Ayerto, uh, people like that. You know, Les McCann was an idol. And then, you know, that's the, the, the jazz guys that really blew me away. And then, then what was also really exciting was uh, people, uh, you know, Placido Domingo and Yo-Yo Ma came on. We did stuff with them. I got to play with Al Green, Ray Charles, you know, uh, just so many great artists. It was really, really exciting for me. So, you know, just uh, I would say that, uh, 
you know, Ray Charles is a person I grew up with, so getting to play with him was really exciting for me. And um, I, I'm trying to remember, there were just so many great musicians. You know who was great to play with was Phil Collins. He's an amazing musician. Oh, okay. Did you have a, a big hand in uh, choosing some of the guests on there? No, okay. no hand at all. I mean, okay. I could make suggestions, and if there's somebody I didn't want on, they wouldn't do it. But I mean, basically, there was a, there were t there were talent bookers that booked the people, but there were jazz people that I suggested. You know, that sometimes they would do, but you know, it was about ratings and record company, and you know, it's all business. You right. Know? Uh, and then sometimes, you know, Arsenio was really a good guy about music. So if I had a friend that I thought would be really great, he would occasionally do that, and he would have friends that he liked, but. It's mostly about business. Do you see, since uh, the show is no longer on the air, the the openness to to creative music in, in some respects is not there? So that you mean, do I think openness in general to creating music? Yeah. Well, Arsenio, you know, he had a lot of great mm -hmm. musical guests and stuff uh, like uh, that. Uh, yeah, I think things have changed. I don't. You know, I think people are in. Actually, now I think people are getting more and more open to music. The jazz world is certainly opening up from that kind of rigid, straight ahead thing to a much more accepting of different kind of grooves within it, which I think is the natural state of jazz, you know, not to be uptight. But, uh, well, you know, what was great about, another thing about Arsenio was that we were able to, our band, which was a live band, played with so many great hip-hop artists and scratchers, and that had never been done before. Uh, you know, we have people like Big Daddy Kane and uh, mm. Shabba Ranks and all these people come and sit in with us. To me, that was groundbreaking. So, you know, I don't see things like that happening too much, though I'm sure they are happening, and there have been, there was that oh, was Studio 54 show, and, you know, there were some other TV shows that do some great stuff with music, but I think Arsenio was the most music-centric of any talk show that there ever was, and I think that's because he loved music so much. So that, when I look at Late Night now, I do think that is definitely missing, you know. Mm -hmm. Would you ever want to go back in that, or you just did it and that's no, left your mark? I would not want to go back in that as a musical director. I would go back to, yeah, well, I, I write music for television shows or films and stuff, and I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to perform on it. I want you know, I'll even act, but to go on as a musical director at this point, no, I, I think I've, I've done made that. your mark. Yeah. And I don't think it'll be as good, ever be as good a show as Arsenio. I think I, I was lucky to get on the best one, you know, mm -hmm. as far as uh, being a musician. And so I don't think I could top that, and you know, so why why go backwards? I, I really like the one thing that was difficult about being on a talk show was having to go to work every day at the same place. It was limiting for myself as an artist. It was great for me as a sort of a craftsman to be able to play for all these different people and make them sound good. And I was very proud of our band and proud of the job. It's a very difficult job, but as an artist who wants to create his own thing, I feel like I need the freedom to to go do that now. You know, I kind of pay my dues with the. The TV show, and now I can go be a musician, you know. And, and you met your wife out there, right? Yeah, I met yeah. my wife on the show, and not going to meet another wife on the show, so I don't right. need to do another show. But yeah, that <laughs> it worked out great. Her name is Polly Draper, and she's right. an actress who was starring on Thirty Something. Right. She came on as a guest, and you know, so that's that's worked out great. Now we have kids and a great life. So, so, uh, so things are mm -hmm. you're definitely blessed, and uh, yeah, and that TV yeah. show has really changed my life in a lot of great ways, and mm -hmm. so it was. Only a positive for me. And I am very blessed, yeah, very lucky. So folks who have just tuned in, my special guest right now is Michael Wolf, talented, I, I mean, just a great musician, pianist, composer, and he is the leader of a band called Impure Thoughts. They'll be at the West Bank Cafe in New York City from April 10th through the 13th, and it's going to be a, gr a great uh, run of dates and uh, no set list, right? No set list, just a lot of music from my CDs and some improvised stuff and some other stuff, and, you know, all mixed in, but definitely no set list. Well, one of the songs which uh, you covered on, on the album, uh, Sexual Healing, Marvin Gaye, mm -hmm. and, and you, you know, I've read you have a really great approach to, to how you, you tackle some of the classics like that. Uh, how'd, you, how'd you do it? Because it's a great, great uh, version, Michael Wolf style. Oh, thanks. Well, you know, I just try to hear what... What's underneath the music? You know, my father was a psychiatrist, and he said what helped him be a psychiatrist was to listen to Count Basie's band because everybody mostly listened to the trumpet and sax. But if you, what's really happening in the music is the bass and the drums. You know, what's underneath it. So when I hear a tune like, you know, what's going on or sexual healing or Papa was a Rolling Stone or Thank You, you know, I try to figure it out, uh, figure out for myself what moves me. What do I just love about this tune? What's What's happening? And sexual healing is a particularly interesting tune because it's not really a melody, you know? It sounds like he's just kind of, Marvin Gaye's just kind of going on with poetically, and it's a beautiful way to do it with a kind of, uh, you know, a little um, 
almost a Jamaican y vibe underneath, a little Calypso y vibe, you know. So I just took that concept and really just took some of the little melodies out of it. He goes, uh, get up, get up, get up, get up. Uh, I took that little lick and da 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 the sexual healing. I just took a couple of little licks that I could glean out of it as some little landmarks and created a group with the Charlie Hunter, this amazing, you know, eight string guitarist uh, whose guitar has low bass strings and high stuff. And you know, we just came up with that groove and, and put those chords together. So. It was just trying to find the essence of what I thought was funky in the tune and yet interpret it, like you said, my style through my vision and also knowing you know, all the musicians that I have because I try a lot of different tunes to see what works with our band and they all don't work with the band. It just has to fit with the way we play also. So this one kind of did. All right, we're going to take a listen to it right now and then we'll come back and talk further with Michael Wolf. And uh, while you listen to it right now, you can go to Michael Wolf dot com with two f's and uh, find out all about the upcoming tour dates and ordering the cd intoxicate this is michael wolf and impure thoughts with sexual healing and what a great version of the classic marvin gay song sexual healing and uh that's done by michael wolf and impure thoughts uh, Intoxicate is the CD. He is going to be appearing with his band at the West Bank Cafe April 10th, uh, Wednesday, until April 13th. And it's going to be a really great uh, stretch of concerts. And, and you're looking forward to having your your fine band together. And, and it's yeah, great. we're really happy about that. And it's great to see most of the players on the record are, are, are playing with you. So, yeah, on yeah. Saturday night we're going to have, oh, is it uh, it's Friday night actually, Danny Gottlieb is going to come and play drums, a little special thing. And, but yeah, it's the, rest of, the rest of it's going to be all the guys on the on the album. Uh, it's it's unique these days to have a band instead of just be a leader and have you know guys that play with you and they record with different people. It's so nice to be able to uh, have a band where everybody's you know together on the record and live. So I'm real happy about that. Yeah, I, I was going to say that that it is is rare. You usually see uh, you know half the band there and and people uh -huh. struggling to put something together. Yeah, so, it's, it's, yeah, it's How, a challenge. <laughs> Now, how about if if you had, uh, let's say, a month's work of studio time to go in there and, and you could bring in some people you wanted to work with all along these years? you think uh, anybody off the top of your mind? I'm sure you have a... Well, there are a lot of great uh, musicians I like to play with. But, you know, I like to play with Wayne Shorter. And, um, probably there's a Paco Serra is an African drummer I love. Um, Dennis Chambers is another drummer I love. Um... God. There's too many, right? <laughs> There's just so many great musicians that I, you know, Marcus Miller, and eh, so many great ones. Um, and you know, I like to do things with uh, people in other genres, you know, so to do something with the Itzhak Perlman, some kind of way that could be worked out, or that would be really fun. One of the things we talked uh, off air about is that uh, in a few months, or maybe even sooner than that, you're going to head on over to Japan, right, for for some distance. Yeah, in the summer. Yeah. Uh huh. I made a deal for this. My album's going to be distributed over there. So I was over there in January, and I'm going to go back either the end of June, beginning of July for a couple of weeks and promote the record and play at some clubs there. And Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I love Japan. It's a great place, and the people are totally into all kinds of music and really strong with jazz and funk. And so uh, it's a great great place to have a career going in, as well as Europe. I'll probably go over there the end, in August. I'll probably go over to Europe for about three weeks and do some playing in Paris and London. So yeah, it's good to you know it's a world, it is a world music you know it's a world of music these days. So it's great to go out and be able to play for every different kind of people. You know that's what I'm into. I'm not into just one thing. I mean that's how my music is. I like to include many different things. It's like I like, I have two dogs. I have a cocker spaniel and then I have a mutt, and I like my mutt much better. You know uh -huh. that's how I like things <laughs> mixed. You know, uh, you know mutt what? music. That's what I call mutt it. music. Uh -huh. <laughs> a la Michael Wolf and uh -huh. Pure Thoughts. And also, uh, it's up on your website, michaelwolf.com. Uh, you've got some some shows on the West Coast. Yeah, well, I'm going to be going right after the West Bank. You know, the West Bank's just coming out Wednesday, the 10th through the 13th, 8 on Wednesday and Thursday, and uh, 9 o'clock on Friday and Saturday. That's at 42nd Street and 9th Avenue in New York. And then after that, on Monday, I'm going to go out to L.A., and that Thursday we're going to be playing at the... Uh, it's called L.A. Jazz 2002. It's a big festival. Sonny Rollins is doing one night. 
Wayne Charge is headlining one night. We're headlining Thursday night, the 18th. At, uh, it's Bovard Hall at USC, so I'm really proud about that. And then, you know, come back to New York and do a little writing, and then we we'll go back out to the Riverside Jazz Festival out about an hour east of L.A., and we'll be out there for a while and do a little tour on the West Coast. And Actually, after the USC thing, I forgot, we're going to go to Colorado. We're going to play in Fort Collins and in Denver. So, yeah, just doing traveling, you know, hitting different little areas and, you know, putting together a little, you have to put together little sections, and we'll do our little southern thing probably in the fall. We'll do New Orleans and Austin and Houston and, uh, you know, just do our little thing. You know, it's fun to get out and play these different places. We've had a really good Midwestern thing going where we play Cleveland, Columbus, Ohio, uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, we play Ann Arbor, Michigan, Buffalo, New York, and we're going to actually play this big a uh, jazz festival, outdoor jazz festival in Indianapolis in July, and we'll be there for a couple of days. So, yeah, it's very fun. Now, now traveling yourself, um, as far far as instruments, do you, do you have things uh, backloaded right there, ready for you? Well, how, how do you work it? On these big concerts, we don't have to bring anything too much, but usually, they, um, you know, they have a piano, and we're trying to bring as little as possible. We have to bring the tablas, some percussion instruments, sometimes the drums. It just depends. But hopefully the people will supply the back line, as they call it, which is the amplifiers and the drums and stuff like that. Because, mm-hmm. you know, it's a lot harder to travel than it used to be since September 11th. Yeah, right. So we've been driving a lot more. We used to always fly everywhere. And now we're finding driving is a lot easier than going out and waiting in those lines for two hours at the airport and hassling with the instruments and saxophone even. And, you know, you just find just hop in the van and go. So... Or we'll fly to one, we'll take one big flight, like to the West Coast, and then drive around there. Or one we do the Southwest, flying to Albuquerque, and then do Taos, Santa Fe, Colorado, that way in, in the van. So, you know, just you have to work it out to be as, as economic and as easy, also just as easy as possible so that you can have your energy to play the music. You right. don't have to just. So as Kenny Rankin, the singer, used to say, I play for free, I get paid to travel. <laughs> and that's really how it feels out there, you know. How about uh, as far as far as traveling? How about some rooms that uh, that you'd love to play? Uh, that you know, if they well, have. Well, you know, I played a lo- most places, or many many places. You know, as a side man with different people, and I've got I got to play the Kennedy Center twice in the last year with my band. I was so thrilled. I got to play at the Terrace Theater, a complete concert, and then I played with the uh, National Symphony Orchestra, or orchestrated couple of pieces for our, for our band and orchestra with Marvin Hamlish conducting at the big hall. I mean, that was a dream come true. Now I'd like to go be a Carnegie Hall <clears throat> and do my concerts. I mean, that's kind of what I'm gearing this stuff for at the West Bank to make it like a big concert. So that's my goal in the next year or two to be able to do that. And then there's some, there's some beautiful places. Um, I was over in Turkey last summer, and we went and visited Ephesus, which is a, an old, you know, early, early town. And I would love to play there. They have a beautiful outdoor theater, Greek theater there. So, you know, I'd like to be at the Greek theater in Berkeley, California, the Playboy Jazz Festival. I played at in L.A. a lot of times, but not with this band. So i like to take this band back to a lot of places that I've played before. And one of the things we should give credit uh, to your parents for some of the, the sounds. Eritrea and Ye- Yemen and Ethiopia about five years ago. And they travel all over the world a lot, and they brought back these cassettes. And frankly, I didn't even know what was on them because it was some kind of Arabic writing or something or whatever. And I started listening to it, and I heard the mix of the Indian and the African, and that's when I decided, oh, this would be perfect for me, for the way I want to play. So I called up Badal Roy on Tablas just because I didn't know him. I'd just seen him on records with Miles Davis and, <clears throat> you know, Baha Vishnu and Look Off Farm and stuff. So he came, and we started writing together, and that's how the whole genesis of the band came about. So there you go, and, and yeah. the CD is available right now. It is on it is. Indianola Music Group, mm-hmm. and uh, you can go to michaelwolf.com, with two Fs.com, get all the information on the bio. Real nice site. Who does your site, by the way? Pardon me? Who who does your it's website? It's a group called Fast Atmosphere. They're out on the West Coast. Okay. Two guys, two young guys, but they do a great job. And your bio and ordering information for your catalog of CDs. Yeah. Uh, Michael Wolf and his band in Pure Thoughts at the West Bank Cafe uh, this week, Wednesday through Saturday. And uh, I'm sure it's going to be different each and every night. Yeah, it's going to it's always going to be different during the night. Yeah. 
You know, it's exciting. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping people will come down and enjoy themselves. We usually do well there. It's only 10 bucks, and for New York, that's really a bargain. There's no minimum or anything, so you can just come and groove. So, so do I need to get uh, my tuxedo over to the dry cleaners for no, next no. year's date over at the uh, Carnegie this. Hall? You Carnegie get, Hall. Yeah, yeah, get warmed up for Tony, Carnegie <laughs> Hall. There you go. This is just a, this is a miniature little place. It's a great place. It holds about 130 people, right. and it's like a little concert thing, and that's really a great place to play. Yeah, I'm, ho- I'm hoping to come down if I can uh, work it with my schedule here. That one of the nights. Yeah, I hope you weekend. can make it yeah. down, man. And, be great. Yeah, as the phones ring and... Uh, no, that's the other line. Don't <laughs> worry about it. But you know what, uh, Michael, we're going to get into a, a track and uh, wish you a lot of success on, on the upcoming dates, and, and thanks so much for appearing Well, here. thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it, and, and you know, appreciate you playing the CD, and the people are listening. It means a lot to me. Okay, let's right. see. Uh, we've got Witch Hunt, uh, which we're going to play right now from Michael Wolf. Cool. And then we'll get into a, a song. Uh, you did uh, Pandora's Box. Right, with, that's the w- tune that I wrote. With your son, right? Uh, no, the one oh. I wrote with him is called Bells. Okay, Bells. Why, well, why don't we go with Bells? We'll Great. go with Witch Hunt and Bells. Great. Uh, and just thanks so much, Michael. Okay, thanks. Okay. Talk to you soon. <laughs> 